Okay, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Scottish Economic Society uh, Adam Smith Lecture. And uh, we're delighted that this year's Adam Smith Lecturer is Professor Sir John Vickers of Oxford University. Uh, Sir John is the Warden of All Souls College, a post he's held uh, since 2008, although his links to Oxford go back to his undergraduate days, I believe. In addition to all his incredibly highly regarded uh, and voluminous uh, academic research, um, mainly uh, but not exclusively in the areas of regulation and competition, John has contributed at the highest levels uh, to the policy arena. For instance, he's been Chief Economist at the Bank of England, a member of the Monetary Policy Committee. He's been uh, the Director General of the Office of Fair Trading, uh, and he, of course, chaired the Independent Commission on Banking, known as the Vickers Commission. Amongst his many accolades, John's a Fellow of the Econometric Society, uh, a Fellow of the British Academy, and a past President of the Royal Economic Society. Of course, I could go on and on with uh, John's uh, achievements and accolades, but I'll stop there because time's precious. John's going to talk for about 50 or so minutes, uh, and then we'll try and fit in uh, a few questions if there's time. So, John, it's a great honour to have you deliver the 2023 Adam Smith Lecture. Thank you. Charles, thank you very much indeed for that uh, um, introduction and for the fabulous invitation to give... Um, this lecture named after Adam Smith. Um, I'd like everyone to know this is the first time I've ever given a lecture wearing tartan. And moreover, I'm assured that this is the Adam Smith tartan. And I know that a, a proper Adam S Smith lecture would go back uh, 250 years into the um, 18th century. I've done a sort of compromise here. And the starting point for what I'm going to be talking about is um, a paper published in 1897, as it happens, the year of foundation of uh, your society. And this is going to be one of two papers that I will have as the building blocks of uh, uh, the talk today. Um, I'll be moving on uh, to talk about joint work with Mark Armstrong, who rather unhelpfully pointed out to me the other day that 1897 is 126 years ago, not 125. I countered by pointing out that the key paper was published in October of that year. We're now in April, moreover, early April, so on any normal rounding principle, I think I'm okay. So this paper um, by Edgeworth uh, w has come down to the English-speaking world of economists in the 1925 edited collection, but it was first published in this Italian journal uh, in three installments in 1897. And that was a banner year for um, uh, economic theory in other ways, because it was also the year in which Cournot's great 1838 um, book on the, um, the theory of wealth, uh, its English edition appeared. So if you can just see down at the bottom, that says um, 1897. And Cournot is going to be another there are three main characters in the story today, Edgeworth, Cournot, and uh, Ramsey is going to be um, the third. I think this work of Cournot, um, we think a lot about Cournot equilibrium, which is how his name is best known, but there's an enormous amount more in the, in the book than that. That is um, a photo I took of the, the uh, title page of the copy of the book, that lives in my college library. It used to be Edgeworth's um, college, so I fondly think that this was the very copy that he used. However, uh, all the signs are that he needed nothing translating into English because he was um, a, a polyglot in many ways. So I don't, I'm not going to push that point too far. It's a very beautiful book. I don't know if you've ever seen it. Compact, 200 pages, and it's got a fold out of, with beautiful diagrams at, at the beginning. And for Edgeworth, Cournot was a tremendously important figure in this book. He called it the alpha, but not the omega, of mathematical economics. And for John Hicks, who did a um, econometric survey of monopoly theory in the 30s, he said this, it was Cournot's creation of elementary monopoly theory, which was the first great triumph of mathematical economics. It's very high praise, and this is John Hicks. 
Yet Cournot had left much undone, and it is not surprising that the endeavour to complete his work should have been an attractive occupation for his successors. And I'll be talking about some aspects of uh, that endeavour um, today. I should, though, say a word or two more about Adam Smith. For him, clearly monopoly was a, a central concern, the great enemy to good management. But we must, I think, be conscious, and I know many of you will have been at the session just now, what monopoly for him probably meant something rather different than for us. It was much more about government grants of uh, exclusive rights and so on, rather than huge economies of scale industries, which are much more of a feature uh, since then. But he said this, he said, the monopolists, by keeping the market constantly understocked, by never fully supplying the effectual demand, sell their commodities much above the natural price and raise their emoluments, whether they consist in wages or profit, greatly above their natural rate. Uh, perhaps unfortunately, he went on to say, the price of monopoly is upon every occasion the highest which can be got, though that is true in a special case which I will be using um, later. Now, whereas um, Cournot uh, spoke about um, Smith and Jean-Baptiste Say as preserving all the beauties of a purely literary style, his enterprise was very much to apply mathematics. The rarity of that, not just when he wrote in the 1830s, but at the end of the century, I think is wonderfully captured by Irving Fisher, who did a review of this um, book. So he, in 1898, wrote, in Curnow's time, mathematical economists could be counted on one's fingers, even thumbs. Today, they muster some 30 active enthusiasts. So that's 1898, there are 30 active enthusiasts of whom Edgeworth was one. So he's going to be um, one pillar of this talk. The other is Frank Ramsey, his um, 1927 paper in the EJ, the, the two great EJ papers by Ramsey. One is on the theory of saving. The one I'll talk about is um, the analysis of um, taxation, commodity taxation. So the problem that he addressed, you see very clearly there, you've got a given revenue constraint how do you raise that revenue by possibly differential taxes on commodities um, in the least bad way? What's the least inefficient way um, to raise that revenue? Now that's going to be, it's not identical to, but in its essentials, it's going to be the same problem as the multi-product monopolist faces, which is how does that um, monopolist um, best maximize profit, perhaps subject to um, a constraint that consumers get a certain amount of surplus. So I'm going to be talking about that problem in its 1897-1927 form and um, so some more recent um, um, uh, instances and, and work. Now, why is, this a, why is this topic important? Well, all actual firms, virtually all, are multi-product firms, so we need to um, uh, have some basic understanding of uh, multi-product um, analysis. There are also many questions, including important live policy questions that are inherently multi-product questions, a few there, questions about price discrimination, um, product bundling, below cost pricing, what if I have market power and I price some, some products below cost, is that sinister necessarily? How, what's the relationship between price and cost? We've got a very good grasp on that in the single product case, but uh, maybe quite different things happen in the multi-product case. Do they or don't they? How can we, um, how can we get a handle on that? Regulation of multi-product monopoly firms, should that simply concern itself with the, some average level of prices or should it get into um, regulating relative prices? There are many, many questions and one could extend that list. There are also some kind of meta questions. We're very well trained in single product monopoly analysis. Can we just carry over what we know and understand from that setting to the multi-product case, or is it more complicated, perhaps much more subtle in that um, case? We often, if you work in multi-product settings, whether it's in trade theory or IO or, or whatever, there are some very commonly used functional forms, a few listed there, are those all like ad hoc and different, or do they have fundamental features in common? Or might there be radical differences between them? Those um, all seem quite good foundational questions to get some understanding of. 
So those are some of the things which I'm going to be um, uh, talking about. I'm, um, my, the outline of what I'm going to say is this. I want to spend a few minutes saying more about what Edgeworth did in his great paper, then Ramsey. Then the next two central blocks are kind of Edgeworth revisited and, uh, sorry, Ramsey revisited, then Edgeworth revisited. A couple of papers with Mark. One is in JPE five years ago and the other um, is forthcoming also in JPE. And another thing I want to try and do is to make some connections between these three great uh, figures of the past. I'm going to, uh, you know, if there was another half hour, I'd do a sort of some kind of sketch of what's in the literature. This is the public finance literature is very relevant, IO, trade, other things as well. But I'm not going to um, uh, dwell on that here because of time. I do, however, want to mention one other great uh, Scottish economist, Jim Murleys, which I do for two reasons. One is um, he, in his work uh, with Peter Diamond and individually in the early 70s, did much to bring uh, Ramsey, the Ramsey paper I'll be talking about, uh, centre stage in uh, the theory of public finance, in, in public economics. So there's that direct intellectual contribution. The other is that Mark and I both had the incredible privilege of being uh, supervised as doctoral students by Jim, and we were later colleagues of his. So this is a Jim-inspired line of work uh, in that uh, sense as well. So that is the plan. Edgeworth. So here is Edgeworth. This isn't just a photo of Edgeworth. It's a photo of a photo of Edgeworth, which, which hangs um, in the common room of my uh, college. And the reason I took this, this photo of the photo was that in lockdown, we're very keen to keep um, academic life going in the college um, in online ways. So I did a, a lunchtime talk on Edgeworth to try and get across what a, a great and um, I mean, extraordinarily eccentric individual um, he, uh, he was and what, how, how important his theory of exchange, which is not today's topic for me, how important um, that was. So I don't know if you can see down at the, the foot of the, the frame there. He, was, um, he died when he just turned 81, and his last 35 years were spent um, in the college during term time. He, he lived in the college, and outside term time, when he wasn't in Ireland or on holiday in the Alps or something, he lived in London, in Hampstead. In fact, his, um, he rented rooms for decades and decades in Mount Vernon, and I recommend anyone with a spare afternoon in Hampstead, go on the Hampstead Economist walking tour, which you can find on the web. And he lived just down the road from Jevons. It, all the action in the 1880s, uh, or a lot of the action that wasn't in Scotland, was in, um, is in Hampstead. Um, he is very important to the Royal Economic Society because he was founding editor of the Economic Journal. And for most of that 35 years, not quite all of it, he was in an editorial capacity in the later years in tandem with Keynes. And as some of you may know, Keynes wrote this um, unbelievably um, vivid biography, a sort of obituary a few weeks after Edgeworth died in uh, early 1926, which is dazzling in every way, except I think it doesn't fully appreciate just uh, how important his intellectual contributions were. So I'm not talking about the theory of exchange today, the contract curve, what later became known as Edgeworth boxes. I'm going to talk about this um, eight, uh, 1897 paper in the Giornale, the, the uh, Italian journal. It was published in three installments, July, October, November. November was a verbal summary of what went before. July was Edgeworth's kind of attack on Cournot, Bertrand, um, in 1883, had criticized Bertrand. I'm not using their language, but Bertrand said, look, firm set price is not quantity, so shouldn't we think in those terms? And Edgeworth was looking at that issue when there are decreasing uh, returns, in fact, very sharply decreasing returns in the form of capacity constraints. Now, many of you in I, or anyone in I.O. will know this, but for the wider audi audience, this is what Edgeworth did. He showed that in the um, Cournot model in those terms, with decreasing returns with capacity constraints, you'd have a wide range where <coughs> there is no um, determinate 
outcome. There's no equilibrium. So Edgeworth was very keen on indeterminacy away from the, um, either the sort of competitive limit or, or in the pure uh, monopoly case. So he says, no, this is wrong. There is um, indeterminacy um, here. And <clears throat> nowadays we would say, aha, now we can wheel out mixed strategies. You'll see that I won't read it out. He had a very nice way of describing indeterminacy, this indeterminate track, track to wherein things vibrate and so on. But there is a, a really beautiful paper 40 years ago, Krebs and Scheinkman in the Bell Journal, just before it became the Rand Journal, which essentially says if you endogenize those capacity constraints, you let the firms independently choose the capacity levels before they compete in prices using mixed strategy equilibria where necessary, and where you have an efficient rationing rule, <clears throat> then you get the Cournot outcome. So they show, it's like turning the point on its head. They say, okay, accept Bertrand and Edgeworth, just endogenize the capacity constraints, that uh, you get the Cournot outcome, which I think is a very beautiful, I'm going to call it my Cournot-Edgeworth link, which is all down to them, Krebs and Shankman. So to the um, October instalment, and <clears throat> this is where um, Edgeworth talked about his paradox of taxation. So he contemplated <clears throat> a monopolist, supplier, let's say, of two products, and we imagine a cost increase or the imposition of a tax on one of those products. What he showed was that it's possible, consistent with all the standard principles of economics, that that cost increase or tax increase, let's say, on product one, could cause both prices to go down. So with market power, monopoly power, uh, you could have a situation where a higher cost of one product would lead both, or in a wider setting, all prices to go down, which I think depends on your uh, initial intuition, but I think for most people that would seem um, very paradoxical. He had a narrative story about railway fares. It's incredibly confusing because there is first class and second class, except second class is called third class. So a problem with Edgeworth is understanding what he's going on about, but he did... Um, have this narrative. And he also gave a um, mathematical example. He said, in, <coughs> um, in um, mathematics, seeing is believing. So I'm not going to go through this example, but those are some inverse demand curves for a case with zero costs where um, his paradox, his price paradox, uh, comes about. Now, if we just pause to think, now, how paradoxical is this? And I want to try and get across in words some economic intuition to suggest it's not crazy, this possibility. So think of it in these terms. If we've got a, the cost of one good going up, the, the rock-solid prediction is that the supply of, the quantity of that product will go down. That is rock-solid, very intuitive. But that reduction is going to induce the monopolist to change supplies of other products, typically, if we're talking substitutes, by increasing the supply of the substitute product. Well, that greater supply from the substitute product, that's going to push down on prices. So we've got, it's a bit more complicated than it seems at first, because we've got the upward um, effect on the price of the taxed good, or the cost increased good. But then there are other things that change, and that, um, uh, I think, suggests there is a, at least a bit of room for this paradoxical possibility to occur. Edgeworth also spoke about a related surplus paradox, where, where you don't have to have all prices come down, but it could be that the price adjustments of the monopolist um, are such that consumer surplus is greater after the tax or the cost increase than before. And I'm leaving aside what happens to the tax revenue. Let's leave that out of account. That is... Um, uh, a, um, um, uh, that surplus paradox, I'm going to call it, is a possibility. That doesn't need all prices to go down. It could be some go up, some go down. But the net effect is good for consumers. And Edgeworth was also very well aware that if you have degrees of freedom on the cost side, then, uh, he said, we have at our disposal more functions with which to manipulate a favourable example. In fact, he calls it a favourable example, indicates he really liked this kind of paradoxical um, possibility. However, 
it went down incredibly badly with most readers. And there was a great rivalry between Edgeworth and um, Edwin Seligman, who was at Columbia. They, they had what's been called a tennis match in, in the economic journals, where the publication lags in the old days were incredibly short, so they would respond to each other's attacks um, very vigorously. And Seligman is quite an important figure, including for Adam Smith, actually. He edited the American edition that came out, I forget exactly when, but circa 1910, I believe. He was very involved in the foundation of the American Economic Association, a founder of the political science quarterly. So a major figure, not, not sort of current uh, in economics, but um, a, a very serious person. As was, much more famously, Harold Hotelling, also at Columbia, who in 1932, so that's just seven years after the um, publication in English of this stuff uh, among Edgeworth's collected work, he wrote a paper in the JPE, which um, I think established this, uh, this paradoxical possibility of Edgeworth's much more on a mainstream um, footing. And very importantly, Hotelling showed that the same paradox could occur under perfect competition, even with marginal cost pricing, if you've got enough action going on of the right kind on the cost side. So that is the, um, that's the October, uh, so 125 and a half years ago, installment um, of what Edgeworth was doing. There's other work since Ronald Coase had a paper in the 1940s. I mean, these sort of very serious economists taking this seriously. Michael Salinger has a paper to do with vertical integration uh, relating to Edgeworth's paradox in the 90s, where he makes the point that if you have a vertical merger, that was a topic at a, a session I was at uh, this morning, if you eliminate the double marginalization through that, what are the knock-on effects for pricing when the firms have market power and when they're multi-product firms? Well, we might want to take the Edgeworth paradoxical possibility seriously. Not to say that it's prevalent, but it is a possibility that we should not um, neglect. So that's one pillar. The other pillar is the Ramsey paper. <clears throat> so I'm sure nearly everybody here will know about Frank Ramsey. So he had these two great papers in economics. They were both in, I think, the top 10 EJ papers selected for the 125th uh, anniversary of that journal. Joe Stiglitz wrote a preface about the Ramsey paper that I will be talking about. And yet, economics was Ramsey's third subject. Uh, philosophy and maths were his, his primary subjects. In philosophy, he knew Wittgenstein well. He translated Wittgenstein into English, made absolutely fundamental contributions to those two subjects as well as to ours. And he did all that uh, before his death at the age of 26. It's a completely extraordinary character. I think nobody comes close um, uh, in sort of fertility of ideas ac across such a range at such an age. And Cheryl Mysack, three years ago, published this um, uh, biography of Ramsey, which I've taken a, 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 a snap of uh, for this. So his 1927 paper, you've seen how he, uh, the question was framed. It was put to him by Pigou. So what pattern of commodity taxes um, maximizes welfare subject to a revenue constraint? And what Ramsey uh, showed immediately is that the natural solution, if you had to guess the sort of in five seconds, uh, certainly I would have said, well, you'll, you'll have the same tax on everything. That is precisely wrong. So the obvious solution um, is uh, entirely erroneous. And what Ramsey showed for very important special cases, a small amount of revenue being one, so it, it general demands, small revenue, and then linear demands, what he showed was the equal proportionate reduction principle that optimal commodity taxes in that setting, and it's a simple setting with no income effects, no externalities, should induce uh, reductions in the output of each good in the same proportion. Now, a lot of people think about Ramsey pricing by a monopolist or Ramsey taxation as the inverse elasticity rule. You'll have higher markups where um, the, the elasticity is lower, elasticity of demand. That's right, and indeed in a little annex he showed exactly that. But that's not the deep principle. The deep principle is about e equiproportionate 
um, reductions. And he gave a, um, an example. You've all heard about the market for lemons. Well, he had the market for damsons. He said the damsons, these really sour fruit, uh, which are uh, used only in conjunction with sugar. And he hypothesized that a uh, proportionate reduction in the supply of sugar might involve a more than proportionate reduction uh, in, the, in the supply of damsons. And therefore, he suggested that it might well be that the optimal tax policy would be to subsidize damsons while you are taxing sugar. So that's his sour fruit uh, example. And clearly, with independent demands, you'd never get anything like that. So he was pointing, and he understood completely the importance of complementarity. Now, this paper has been stupendously important in public finance. Joe Stiglitz called, calls it really the foundation of, of public finance theory. Um, Diamond and Murley's generalized it. You can uh, uh, apply it to questions about taxing um, um, income from savings. There are labor market points, and, and so on and so forth. I'm going to stick rather prosaically to the I.O. setting. And uh, some of the questions I now want to go on to are, well, does this principle of equal proportion reductions, does that apply? When does it apply more generally? What can we say about those cases? Are they common, special? And um, what can we go on to say about policy towards multi-product monopoly, for example, when uh, monopoly is being regulated? So, um, the plan... I want to say. I want to begin with a ramsey Curnow connection. I promised you links between all these people. I'm then going to talk about what, what I'll uh, describe today as neat demand systems and then say a bit about the regulation point. Now, I can almost hear a chorus of voices, where's the model? There's the model. This is a super standard model. There's n it, uh, no asymmetric information, no two-sided markets, no behavioral economics. This is as orthodox as could be. So we have n products. Um, the quantity vector is x. The price um, vector is, uh, is, is p. Um, consumers have, we, we've got no income effects, so we can think in terms of a representative consumer. Gross utility function u of x. We can get from that the inverse demands, the marginal utilities. It's going all to be linear pricing. Um, I mean, a very interesting further question is what about non-linear pricing? This is all linear pricing. Uh, revenue is R of X. And the thing I really want to highlight on this slide is to think about consumer surplus as a function of quantities. So S of X is consumer surplus as a function of quantities. We normally think about consumer surplus as indirect utility function V of P. This is, say, think instead in terms of quantities. And that's, I think, as far as we can tell, very rarely done, but we uh, see it as a fantastically useful um, analytical tool, and I hope that will come out in some of the things that I'll be talking about. Cost side, um, for quite a bit of the time, I'm going to have constant returns on the cost side, but let's keep it general for now. Uh, profit is exactly what you'd expect it to be, and I'm going to suppose that the monopolist objective is to maximize, I'm calling phi of x, which is uh, profit plus parameter alpha times consumer surplus. So pure profit maximization is alpha zero. Sort of total welfare maximization is alpha um, equal to one. <clears throat> and one can imagine flexing that parameter. This would allow for um, altruism, um, you know, any, anything you like. And it's going to be of interest as we vary this, um, this uh, parameter. So henceforth, the monopolist is going to be maximizing that for some given level of alpha. And the first order conditions for that problem uh, can be written very compactly in the way you see there, which in words says price minus marginal cost equals 1 minus alpha times the derivative of consumer surplus with respect um, to uh, outputs. So that del, del S, the upside down triangle S, that's the vector of partial derivatives. So this says that Ramsey's damsons, where you'd want to go below marginal cost pricing, 
that's associated precisely with a case where consumer surplus as a function of outputs is decreasing um, in the supply of damsons. So sort of ds by d damsons uh, is negative. That will give you um, below cost pricing. Now, here is the ramsey Curnow connection. So one reason that I introduced the alpha parameter is that we can give ourselves a lot of results for oligopoly for free in this context. So imagine there are M firms. Let's say there are two firms. They're both multi-product firms. They're symmetric. They're supplying the full range of products. So this is multi-product um, duopoly, let's say. If we set alpha equal to M minus 1 over M, so in the two-firm example, that's a half, uh, we then find a very, I think, very nice connection between the Ramsey problem and the Cournot problem. And the result is that <clears throat> if we calculate the Ramsey optimum for alpha is a, is a half, and then we divide the quantities at that optimum equally between the two firms, we discover that what we've got is a Cournot duopoly equilibrium. So this not only characterizes the oligopoly equilibrium, you can do it for any M, it also guarantees existence of that equilibrium. So we, we get for free an existence result. One of the strange things about being supervised by Jim, I was doing game theory and he was all about optimization, so we kept having this uh, um, sort of different perspective thing. Here's an example where the solution of an optimization problem is um, an oligopoly equilibrium. Alas, we haven't been able to generalize it beyond the symmetric case. It seems special to that, but it's still um, uh, uh, a result that we didn't expect to find, but uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a true result, and it means that everything I'm, I'm about to say about monopoly, you could imagine a, um, a parallel set of remarks about oligopoly if you set the level of alpha right. So that's a ramsey Cournot connection. So, uh, so we've now got two legs of the triangle, because krebs Scheinkman did um, edgeworth Curnow. this is ramsey Curnow, and later on we'll have ramsey edgeworth Now, remember that the key thing that Ramsey emphasized was equal proportionate um, reductions. So I'm now going to um, ask, when does that property hold more generally? I should make the following aside first, though. The, the Ramsey problem the tax problem is essentially how do you maximize a weighted average of revenue and welfare. What we're looking at here is essentially how do you maximize a weighted average of, of profit and welfare. That's equivalent to a weighted average of consumer surplus and welfare. So they're not identical problems, but they're unbelievably similar. They're similar in their essentials. But in case any of you were uh, bothered about that, I, I make that aside remark. So when, when does the, the, this property hold more generally, not just in the linear case? <clears throat> well, the answer is when the utility function takes the form that you see there. There's that utility is the sum of two, two bits. So um, H is a homogeneous degree one function. Any homogeneous degree function you like, it's got, it's got to have the normal it's got to be increasing, um, um, and H, well, H of zero is zero, of course. Uh, plus this g of q of x. So this, this is g function, function of a composite output measure q, which itself is homogeneous degree one in, in x. Now, what I want to argue are two things. First of all, that basically all the commonly assumed demand systems fit that. And secondly, that this general class has very neat properties. So that's why I'm calling these um, neat uh, demands. So to make good the first claim, first of all, anything, any homothetic preferences, think um, constant elasticity of substitution, things of that kind, they all fit that because they have that H bit at the front, um, not, not entirely, they have the H bit at the front zero and they have homogeneous uh, thing with, with the quantities. Linear fits that, even with lots of cross effects in demand, so generalized linear. In the class of discrete choice models, logit fits that. In fact, logit demands, and one can have fancier logit than that, but that, that's standard logit demand. That corresponds 
to an incredibly simple um, surplus function. The surplus is just 1 minus the log of 1 minus q, where q is simply the sum of all the demands. So I think if I had to do one advert of why thinking in terms of this s of x function can be very neat, um, that would be my, my exhibit A. So if we're in that world of neat demands, what, um, what happens? Well, the reason this is, um, is neat and it del delivers the Ramsey um, equal proportion point is that the problem that the firm faces, and there's a parallel problem that consumers in their optimization are facing, it, it breaks down into a two-step optimization. <clears throat> and in a sense, never mind the details. Some of the details are there if you want to look at them, but the core idea is this. You can think of the firm's problem as what mix of quantities, what relative quantities shall I choose? And then at what scale shall I supply those quantities? So there's a sort of separability between the relativities question n minus one dimensions and the levels uh, scalar uh, one dimension. And because you can break it down in that way, you instantly get the Ramsey property. Because the optimal mix of quantities, the op optimal relativities, don't depend on alpha. They're the same for all alpha. So instantly, you've got this equal proportionate um, response uh, uh, quality property coming out. Step one in the optimization is independent of alpha. And then the second question is, OK, what scale shall I supply uh, these quantities? Moreover, if you think back, I had that price marginal cost equation. It's just a one-line argument from what I've just said to the conclusion that price cost margins, um, when we have, this is um, constant returns on the cost side, I should have em emphasized that too, you will get um, equal proportionate expansions, contractions in price cost margins. So everything here is equiproportionate in this world of um, neat demands. It's very easy to generate price cost formulas. <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to go through the details now. Simplest case of all with linear demands, no matter how involved the cross effects, you get that um, the lower of those two equations. Price is, price is just equal to the average of the intercept parameter A and the, the cost level. Sort of amazing that there are no cross cost effects. I wouldn't personally have guessed that. So it's just as if these were all independent um, demands. But more generally, it's very easy to do price cost pass through analysis. And that can matter in all sorts of applications. Let me give you one from competition law. Suppose there's been a cartel of some commodity and that there's been an overcharge of prices to downstream producers of 20%. What has been the effect on prices downstream from them? That's a cost pass-through question. And if they're multi-product firms, which they almost certainly are, then this kind of cost pass-through question is really quite uh, important. And in this world of neat demands and constant returns, um, they're quite uh, um, easy to crack and to solve. So one, I think one lesson that I've taken from this is I've spent decades writing down particular functional forms. One should hold the pen. Don't do that until you've at least tried to do it much more generally. Because using this wider class, if what you were about to put down was a member of it, stay general, and you will not only get a more general result, you'll get, uh, in my experience, much simpler results. It's much easier to see what's going on than with this forest of uh, summation signs, which my doodle pad uh, suffers from. Final point about neat demands, the Edgeworth paradox, the thing about uh, a cost level going up, causing prices to go down, that cannot happen in this world. Neither can you get the surplus paradox. Because if any cost goes up, that's going to, um, uh, hopping back to the previous slide, that kappa thing there for any of you who are looking at that, that will increase if any individual cost goes up and that will lead to a contraction of quantity and uh, that will um, be bad for consumers. So no Edgeworth paradox in this world. Final point, then I'll revisit Edgeworth. Monopoly regulation, um, 
somebody who, who work in this area or on models of um, in incentive theory of adverse selection will know the Baron and Myerson paper from 82, which is for single product monopoly. So all real world monopolies are multi-product. They're all, instead of just the cost level, there might be a whole array of uh, unit costs. Can we say what optimal regulation subject to asymmetric information looks like in that uh, world? This is a very complicated, it's a multi-dimensional screening problem. Very few of those have been solved. But if you have neat demands, plus a statistical property that I'll, I'll mention, then you can fully solve that problem, essentially by saying we're going to regulate your average prices, but we're not going to bother about your um, relative price setting. Because you, the firm, in the, if you're in a neat demand world with constant returns, you have very good incentives aligned with the public interest for the setting of relative prices. The statistical property that you need for the argument to work is that there be stochastic independence between cost relativities and the average level of cost. Because if that holds together with neat demands, um, even if the regulator knew the cost relativities, she, he would not wish to use that information. It would make no difference. Therefore, one, the, the, essentially the proof says, suppose they know it, conclusion, it doesn't make any difference to what they do. Therefore, we have an optimum even for the world in which they don't know it. That's the kind of argument. So, neat demands, this has all come from the Ramsey inspiration, uh, can give you uh, results in an asymmetric information world too. Now, finally, let's revisit um, Edgeworth. And I want to go back to his um, uh, October 1897 question about how a unit cost increase for one product of a multi-product firm might affect the whole panoply of prices, how it might affect consumer surplus, what it might mean for cost pass-through uh, possibilities more generally, and then finally sort of do a, a, a tie the ribbon connecting um, Edgeworth and Ramsey. So to be a little bit more specific than I was in the uh, uh, earlier outlining of this, I'm going to suppose we've got a multi-product firm out there to maximize this phi function. You remember that's, what, that's profit plus alpha times consumer surplus. So you work out the optimum, then a cost increase happens to product one. The, the whole cost curve shifts up by T per unit. Firm re-optimizes. What does the new optimum look like? Or you think of it differently. It could be that T is that cartel overcharge or, or anything you like uh, in, that, in that context. Now, an immediate result is that when that happens, at the new optimum, the firm will supply less of product one, which is very, very intuitive. And it's a one-line revealed preference argument, just inequalities. You don't need to work out any first order conditions or anything like that. Moreover, if um, things are smooth, differentiable, and we started off with an interior solution pre the cost increase, then the drop in the supply of that quantity will be um, uh, strictly a drop, strict inequality. Uh, another thing you can deduce immediately is that if all products are complements, then you're never going to get the Edgeworth paradox because that would mean every, if, if all prices went down, that would cause um, the quantity of the good we're um, uh, talking about uh, to go up. And that's that clearly can't happen because by our one-line argument, the first thing we deduced was it's got to go down. So if, if all products are complements, you haven't got a chance. But what, what I'm going to show is in any other case, you could get the Edgeworth paradox, very much in the way that Edgeworth himself speculated. Another thing that Mark and I were keen to do was to give an example of the paradox, um, definitely simpler than Edgeworth's own, and... Um, uh, even simpler than hotellings, which in 1932, which is itself quite complicated. And we wanted to do it without cheating on the cost side. So we wanted to do it with um, uh, zero costs or um, um, constant unit costs. So here is an example. I won't go through it laboriously. Um, discrete choice, uh, constant unit costs, 
each consumer, there's a mass of consumers of one, each is going to buy one unit of one product if they get non-negative value from either product, and they'll do it the one with the highest um, surplus. Suppose that consumers have a common and known value for product one, whereas their valuations of product two are not known to the firm. What you can show there is if you start with an interior solution and you increase the cost of, of product one, um, consumers will benefit, not lose out, because the price of product one will stay at the just below the ceiling, the valuation, the highest price which can be got, as Adam Smith called it. This is the inelastic demand case. But in order for the demand for that good to go down, it must be that the other price comes down. So here's a, a sort of quick and immediate way of getting uh, an example of the Edgeworth paradox. Another feature to draw attention to of this example is that the mono profit maximizing monopolist produces more of product one, supplies more of it, than would be produced in competition. So this is like monopoly oversupply of a good. It's like the quantity analog of pricing below marginal cost. That is where monopoly price is lower than competitive price. This is where monopoly supply, quantity, is greater than efficient supply. So that's a thought we're going to come back to in just a moment. In the current paper, we, Mark and I then go through linear example. So it's lin linear demands, linear marginal costs as well, not, uh, not necessarily constant unit costs. And to cut to the chase in view of time, <coughs> we get the, the general n by n cost pass-through matrix, which tells you how the <coughs> increase of cost of product J would feed through to the price of product I, that matrix, uh, and here I really am cutting to the chase, is the product of two positive definite matrices. And moreover, um, one can choose, provided one stays with positive definite matrices, you can choose those matrices to be anything you like without violating basic economics of supply and demand. So this gamma big gamma matrix is the key thing, and you can calculate the, what the optimal prices are um, in terms of that. So you could ask the general question, okay, well, what, what candidates could there be? What could qualify as a legitimate cost pass-through matrix? And the answer is, well, anything that's the product of two positive definite matrices. So that takes you into um, linear algebra, and you'll be delighted to know that uh, the answer is that any matrix which is, in the, ma in the linear algebra sense, um, <coughs> similar to a positive definite matrix, it qualifies as a possible one. And their key characteristic is that they are all diagonalizable with positive eigenvalues. The uh, takeaway from that is, on average, when the cost of a good goes up, its price goes up. That's true on average across the products. But if you've got enough asymmetry, you can get it going the other way, in the Edgeworth way. And you can get a whole column in the matrix with negative entries, which is his paradox. Next step is to say, well, if we can play around with the cost function, they've got to be well-behaved cost functions. But his keying off his remark that one has more degrees of freedom to manipulate a favorable example, that turns out to be totally true in the sense that if, there's, if product one has any uh, is sub degree of substitutability with another product, then with the right cost function, you can get the Edgeworth paradox. So in that sense, and you have to be ingenious, but there's a sense in which it's conditionally ubiquitous, which uh, surprised us. The surplus paradox, easier to get. Um, you, you don't need to be as ingenious, but again, it's not the normal case, but it's very much um, gettable. And this brings us to the link to Ramsey, which is this. If you ask how consumer surplus varies uh, with, a, uh, a, say, a tax or a cost increase on product one, the answer is it is absolutely equal to the negative of how the output of that good varies if you increase the Ramsey parameter. So if you wind up that Ramsey parameter, um, 
you'll, you'll get a variation in the quantity of product one. And minus that is exactly how consumer surplus varies with uh, the tax on that good. And again, the arguments are one liner. They're both sides of that are simply the cross derivative of the phi function uh, at its maximum value. So this is a very tight link between when you can get Edgeworth surplus paradox and when you get um, the quantity of a good decreasing with the Ramsey parameter. As we go towards more competition, the supply of that good falls. So it's not a quirk of that discrete choice example that you have that effect. And it, it boils down to saying wherever we have monopoly supply of something exceeding competitive supply, then there lurks an Edgeworth surplus paradox somewhere as we go on the path from alpha zero to alpha equal one. And that gives you a clue to how you can find lots more examples of this paradox. So um, with 10 minutes left, I think, Charles, um, what I would draw is, I, th I find these questions quite intriguing, and I think they're important that we understand these basics because of the prevalence of multi-product firms, the questions that are about multi-product issues, um, the applications, whether it's trade theory, uh, IO, wherever. So I think it's good to understand these things. We've got these unbelievable pillars from these papers, ancient papers, 125 years ago and 95 years ago. And I, I hope to have got across that I think there's quite a bit more juice in these, um, in these lines of thought. If you're willing to assume we're in a world of so-called neat demands and um, uh, constant returns to scale, then the good news is everything is fine, standard intuitions all apply, and on a plate you have the standard uh, formulae to do comparative static exercises and so on. If, however, you want to go into the wilder, more mysterious terrain that Edgeworth um, began to map out 125 years ago, where all sorts of weird and wonderful things uh, can happen, then you have clues to that um, as well. There are many more multi-product monopoly questions um, to be investigated, or which I could have talked about, and that is even 125 years on. Thanks. <clears throat> Okay, so I think we have uh, just unbelievably perfect timing. That is so disciplined. That is incredible. So I think we've got some time for some questions. C can I kick off with a, a quick one, actually? As a wretched macroeconomist, I get no business asking a question in this form. But, but when Edgeworth was, was discussing these questions, did he think they were just weird counterexamples or... Or he wasn't being frivolous, was he? Because by the sounds of it, you know. Um, no, I think he certainly was not being frivolous. He was very keen to um, apply mathematical methods and thought that was a way to bring out insights and truths. Um, that was part of the dispute with Seligman, who was much more in a sort of historical tradition. And again, remember that extraordinary Irving Fisher remark about 30 ac active enthusiasts. And it's sort of not that long ago. Um, so I think it was a very serious uh, pursuit to investigate things. I think he clearly, he, he liked the paradoxical. So, and the, the, his phraseology fits with that. You, you mentioned macroeconomics. This is probably going much too far, but um, I did even wonder whether, the, with these neat demands, whether there might be some um, macro applications. If you just think, say, of sticky price models, um, sort of Calvo type, there, you, in a way, one of the welfare losses is that you get stuck with the wrong relative quantities until there's a chance to change prices. So I did even wonder whether a formulation like that might, might bring out a bit more transparently and possibly more generally than some functional forms what goes on in that setting. So I didn't, I wasn't bold enough to say that in my remarks, but you're mentioning macro. Well, it's possible, made I guess, me wonder, actually. Because yeah. um, with Calvo pricing, of course, there's a small atom of firms that effectively never get to change because yep. the price 
Um, it, we kind of put that under the carpet, um, but, but yeah. And, and in, indeed, in the original Ramsey paper, he did analyze the case where some, some goods cannot be taxed. So the same economics comes through, even for a subset of prices. So, um, you know, some being constrained or, or only flexible at particular junctures. Yes. Um, that, that opens this up the two, possibility I, to... I think this two-step optimization thing is really a really cool feature. Yes. Uh, and you, it just helps you think straight as well. Uh, yes. Yes. Oh, there's a question over, over here. Sorry, could you just, sorry, we'll, we'll get a microphone to you in two seconds. Thank you. Uh, oh, thanks. Uh, so how restrictive is this need demand world if we think about all the modern like applications applied and so on? So are we really kind of tying our hands to things that, are, that work well analytically, but maybe they don't have that much real world power? Is so, the need, need demand? These need demands. Well, I, mean, I feel very torn on that because they, they clearly are, are restrictive. Um, I mean, in, in some respects, very restrictive. And yet, the um, very often assumed uh, cases like linear, logit, CES, which in a, in a sense, they, I've always thought of them before as rather different from each other. They're kind of, you know, they're all different things. They all fit into this, and so do, you know, unlimited other possibilities. Because with neat demands, you've got three degrees of freedom. You can choose the H thing, you can choose the Q, and you can choose the G. So there's, you know, a cornucopia of choices while staying within that family. You do need constant returns on the cost side as well for the neat results to come through. But if you've got those ingredients together, and again, I'd stress the value of staying as general as you can uh, before you put in a particular functional form, because it may be that what you're finding for your particular functional form is true of, I mean, conceivably, all neat demands, or maybe all neat demands with um, a particular form of H function, like linear or something like that. So uh, it is restrictive, and Edgeworth has shown of all these intriguing possibilities that are very non-neat. But you know, a lot of our everyday practice as economists is within uh, the umbrella that they provide. Uh, question there. Just, uh... Mary? Oh, no, no, sorry. Sorry, I, I get defective. Did you want to ask a question? Oh, okay. Sorry. Lady there, and then uh, Professor Morgan here. Uh, thank you. So just a clarifying question. I think you had a condition for the Q, but not for the G in the composition. Um, I wanted to ask what uh, constraints must you place on the G function in order to right. maintain the properties <clears throat> that you want for your need demand? Sure, I, I won't hop back to the slide, but you, the, the U function, um, we need to be concave, and we need U of zero to be zero. So the G function needs to inherit those properties. So we need G of zero to be zero, and we need G concave. And then that, that, those are the only restrictions. So there's a lot that you can do within that. And G could be a... G could be a negative function, and indeed linear has that. It's minus a load of quadratic stuff. Or it could be a, um, a positive function in, in some other settings. So that too is very flexible, but it's got to be concave, or else you wouldn't have a concave utility function to begin with, and that would break the rules of the game. Yes, thank you very much. I mean, could you just go back to your last slide? Was that possible? Um, I, oh, yes. This one? Yeah, that's, yes. I mean, that, and it kind of follows on the question over here about um, your points about being general and it having this 
sort of general and flexible, but if you're not there, all sorts of things can happen. Yeah. And I, I love this paradox. Maybe it's the Vickers paradox, right? <laughs> but, um, you know, exactly the same thing was said by Samuelson after his, the first ever simulation. This kind of being able to define a model which has this generality and flexibility, but on the other hand, if you're not in there, anything can happen. And I wonder whether you had a kind of special name for this kind of model which, for which this is true. Because it seems to me quite an interesting, it, it's a bit like a model organism in biology. You know, you pick it, it, it's typical for a whole set of things. It really helps you to think about those sort of things. But if you're not, in, in one, of, if you're not one of those, if you're not a plant like this, forget it, everything can happen, or anything can happen. So I just wonder that, mm. whether there's, you've got an, you know, whether there should be a name for that kind of model which actually in, ela enables you to explore lots of things, um, uncover lots of things, and join lots of things up, and yet, somehow, elsewhere, there's, beyond that, there's, anything can happen. So, th 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 thanks, and I should go and look at the Samuelson uh, uh, point that uh, you referenced, thank you for that. So I'm, I'm personally in two minds about this, because the, in a way, the, the two papers Mark and I have been working on, one is sort of happy and constructive and everything simple, and the other is, whoa, you know, all, it, almost nihilistic. Um, I think it's not, it's, it's not altogether clear how to think about that, but I think it's very important that we're, we're aware of what we're assuming and what we're not assuming. And... You know, if you're happy with NEAT, if you think that empirically fits the context you're looking at, then it's all completely fine. But the um, more woe bit is saying, well, yeah, but if you're not, then you could be into all sorts of things that you perhaps didn't even think about. Now, of course, it's not that you land in paradoxes the moment you stray outside NEAT. I mean, there's a huge... Uh, intermediate terrain before you would get to paradoxical possibilities. But Mark and I, and this is a, just a reflection on our, our false, our wrong priors, we were surprised how, once you start looking, Edgeworthy things, uh, th there's quite a lot of possibilities out there. They're not freakish, I wouldn't say, these examples. So again, I think the, the important thing is be, be aware of what you're assuming and what, what might happen if you went outside the bounds of those assumptions.